Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the opening of the public conversations on literature, languages, and social justice. Uh, I'm Nuria Godon, Associate Professor and Head of the Spanish Program, and along with my colleague, Dr. Alejandra Aguilar, uh, we are the co-organizers of this event. Some weeks ago, Dr. Aguilar came to me with this wonderful idea of putting together a series of talks to bring prominent scholars in the film of the Hispanic studies. These scholars are working on the role of literature and languages in the pursuit of social justice from an international perspective. Uh, for this fall semester, we are honored to count with three wonderful academics, Dr. Joseph Maddox from the University of Alabama, who is with us today to talk about blackness, the past and the future of a new world. Uh, our second guest will be Dr. Aurelie Vialet from Stony Brook University. She will talk about the penal colony, race and biopolitics in the carceral archipelago of the Philippines on November 3rd. And our last guest speaker of the semester will be Dr. Mercedes Lopez Rodriguez from the University of South Carolina, who will talk about the whiteness and other racial uh, fictions in Colombia. And this will happen on Monday, November 16th. Uh, we would like to thank you to thank the Department of Languages, Linguistics and Comparative Literature that hosts these conversations and recognize the support of the Dorothy Smith College of Arts and Letters and the Hispanic Honor Society Sigma Delta P that helped help with the promotion of this event. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you with us this afternoon. Welcome everyone and enjoy the talk. Uh, I leave you now with Dr. Aguilar. Hi, I welcome you all to our conversation on literature, linguistic and language and social justice. Thank you for being uh, here today. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know me, uh, my name is Alejandra Aguilar. Um, I am assistant professor here um, in Florida Atlantic University. And I want to echo the, Dr. Godon to um, thanks all of our sponsors for making this event possible. A special thanks to Dr. Nuria Godon for co-organizing this event and to our director of communication, Polly Burks. Um, I am so, so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Sean Maddox, who is going to discuss with us uh, blackness, the past and the future of new world, the, the Nuevo Mundo. I want to remind you, you all that after Dr. Amado's presentation, we will open the floor for questions and comments for participants. You also can use the chat uh, for any question if you may have during the presentation, if you like. Dr. Maddox is an associate professor of Spanish and African American studies at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He holds a combined PhD in Spanish and Portuguese for Vanderbilt University. He has taught a Spanish and Portuguese language, Spanish for specific purposes and advanced Spanish, American and Brazilian literature and culture for undergraduate and for master in teaching students. Dr. Maddox has published extensively on contemporary Luso-Hispanic literature and culture with a special focus on Afro-Hispanic writers. I don't wanna read the whole list because it's really a lot, he's uh, published a lot, but I just gonna uh, have any kind of um, information or reference on the chat if you would like to know more. His book of literary criticism challenges the Black Atlantic, the New World novels of Zapata Libesha and Gonzalez has been published uh, for the Berkeley University Press. And I'm happy to announce that it's now available in Amazon. Uh, and we will have all the information on the chat also if you are interested. Dr. Maddox is also the co-author uh, with Thomas Stephens of the Dictionary of Latin American Identities. We will be released in a few months by the University of Florida Press. Dr. Maddox is a candidate for president of the American Association of Teacher and Spanish and Portuguese. He has organizing conference uh, for this organization in 2010, I believe in Mexico and in 2016 uh, in Miami. He won the uh, 2015 Outstanding Scholar Publication Award. And this is 
only a brief selection of his achievement. We are very, very honored to have Dr. Malos with us today. Please join me to welcome Dr. Malos. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra, for that generous introduction. Thank you, Nuria, for your introduction as well. I'm very excited and honored to be here at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County, uh, to the Palm Beach County and Discover the Palm Beaches. Uh, and I want to say how special it is that this is a Sigma Delta Pi event for me because I'm the coordinator for Sigma Delta Pi at my home university at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for my talk today uh, called Blackness, the Past and the Future of a New World, the Nuevo Mundo. It's 2020. It's been a strange year and it's been a year of change. Uh, it's been a year when people are revisiting social justice and when people are revisiting the past. And I'm proud to say that my current hometown of Birmingham, Alabama is where the movement to change our national monuments restarted in the wake of the police murder of George Floyd. Uh, people were angry, people were mourning, people were in the streets and a local comedian uh, suggested that people channel their, their anger into our many monuments here in Birmingham uh, to the Confederacy. And so people across the nation now are deciding that they don't want to be represented by the Confederacy. They don't want to be represented by the oppressors of the past. And uh, in Latin America, that's going to take the form in many cases of rejecting the image of Columbus as a symbol of colonialism. And this is something that reaches all the way to uh, Minnesota here in the United States. So uh, as you can see, uh, Prince uh, better exemplifies our values today, uh, according to the 9,000 people who signed a petition uh, to change this monument. What these people are engaging in is what African American studies scholar Tobias v. C. Van Veen calls chronopolitics, which is the politics of representing time, of representing past, present, and future. And what I'm going to talk about today is a unique kind of chronopolitics called the Nuevo Mundo. So here's an overview. I'm going to tell you what my book is about so that you understand what this uh, presentation, how this fits in it. Who is Manuel Zapata Oliveira, uh, one of the authors that I work on? What is Changul, the biggest badass, a 1983 novel? And what is the Nuevo Mundo? And lastly, how does the Nuevo Mundo concept show us how we can create a better future for the Americas? Basically, Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic does not include Latin America, which I think is a travesty because most enslaved people went to the Spanish and Portuguese colonies. Most Black people live outside of the United States, and sometimes that's a surprise uh, to my students and even my colleagues. Well, Gilroy's blind spot extends to other areas than simply representing Black subjects, and each of my chapters focuses on different uh, aspects that these novels reveal, but that Gilroy ignored. So in the first one, uh, I talk about Gilroy's engagement with uh, the postmodernist debates. Now, Paul Gilroy is writing in a context of globalization. He's writing in a context of debating over uh, modernism. And his term, the Black Atlantic, has really come to represent any Black people outside of the United States, any book about Black people out, outside of the United States will likely be called something of the Black Atlantic, like my book, for example. So Gilroy is in Britain, and he's trying to insert African-American history and uh, African diaspora history into these debates. And I would argue using these novels, that we need to be able to 
distinguish historical fact from fiction, not fact in a positivistic sense, not fact in a way that ignores the possibility for other ways of understanding, such as myth, literature, and legend, but something that is, that takes very seriously the representation of marginalized subjects going back to the 16th century. We need to be inspired by fictions, we need to be inspired by myth, we need to listen to oral sources, but we also need to do the work of historians to discover what was real and what was not. For example, Bancos Biojo is uh, considered the founder of the first free people of the Americas. When there is scant, if any, evidence of him, and my book goes into that, uh, in the case of Ana Maria Gonsalves, the other author I work with, she talks about Luisa Mahin. There is scant evidence of her. Most of the evidence we have of her comes from the testimony of her son, Luis Gama, which Alejandra has, uh, has written on very eloquently. Secondly, I, uh, in the second chapter, I talk about Brazilian runaway slave communities or quilombos. For Zapata Oliveira, these are a model for a utopia, for a just future. He's very idealistic, very utopian in his thought. He's a friend of Abdias do Nascimento, arguably the most influential Afro-Brazilian thinker of the 20th century. And so he expects a lot out of uh, Quilombo communities that in their own context may not have seemed realistic. And Ana Maria Gonçalves talks about the bonds that people fo uh, form there and about how Quilombos served immediate practical ends. She's, she's writing about a survivor more so than a uh, person who is imagining a, a utopia. The third chapter talks about double consciousness. Paul Gilroy's book is called uh, The Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness. Zapata actually goes into this concept with his character of W.B. Du Bois. He's talking about his legacy of double consciousness. And he talks about Du Bois' um, distance often from uh, the, the masses, the, the, uh, the black masses. He was often viewed as an elite figure. And so his work is trying to combine these two forces of a black intelligentsia with uh, the masses. Double consciousness would be uh, the how black subjects are hybrid subjects and how the elements of their culture uh, are going to lie beyond the West. Ana Maria Gonçalves's work talks about double consciousness in a unique way because her protagonist is an enslaved woman. She's brought from Africa to Brazil. Eventually she gains her freedom and returns to Africa and actually becomes a colonizer there of sort of the retornados of the brasileiros in the slave coast of Africa. And so she actually lives on both sides of double consciousness, which is a reality that the Anglophone uh, system of slavery or the Anglo system of slavery simply would not permit in most cases. In chapter four, I talk about gender. Uh, Manuel Zapato Oliveira uh, writes about Changó, which is an androgynous deity. He writes about uh, homosexual deities and uh, things that are considered LGBTQ or queer tend to occupy a spirit realm. And he also writes uh, in a way that has been highly influential on female Afro-Colombian writers today. And Gonsalves naturally uh, writes about a woman's perspective because her protagonist and narrator are, are, is a female, but she's also writing about LGBTQ characters, which you don't often see in depictions of the slave past. And lastly, I try to bring the Black Atlantic up to date. Paul Gilroy was writing in 1993 before the prison industrial complex was as strong as it is today, especially in the United States. This is something that's affecting uh, people of color throughout the Americas, uh, which is using the war on drugs to imprison people. And so I think that should be considered in any discussion of the African diaspora in the Americas today. Uh, Zapata presents it as yet another form of 
uh, oppression or of imprisonment of black subjects. So uh, that's the context that the Nuevo Mundo discussion is in. Let's talk about what Nuevo Mundo means. We'll break down the etymology. The word Mundo comes from the same word as Bantu, like Bantu languages. Bantu is plural, Mundo is singular. Mundo uh, simply means man or human, better said in today's parlance. Uh, it also means a vision of the individual that is not separate from nature, as it is in the West. In the West, we tend to view nature, uh, plants and animals as objects. Uh, this worldview envisions those things as part of the subject. Also, the Muntu is able to communicate with the dead. There's, there's contact between the living and the dead. So these, this individual can draw life force or life energy from ancestors that have passed on and vice versa. The Nuevo Muntu comes from the Spanish for Nuevo Mundo, or in Portuguese, Novo Mundo. Mundo sounds even more like Muntu, so there's this whole play on words in Zapata's work. He's rewriting the colonization of the New World, of the Americas, to envision an entirely different new world, a truly new world in which oppression no longer exists. The Nuevo Mundo, since it means the new man, evokes Che Guevara's Hombre Nuevo. I'm going to talk a little bit about that influence. And the Nuevo Mundo, since in Zapata's telling, humanity begins in Africa, and science supports this, humanity begins in Africa, uh, the new Negro is also evoked by the Nuevo Mundo because the model of humanity is rooted in Africa. The new Negro is a term coined by Alan Locke. It's also the term used for what we call today more commonly the Harlem Renaissance movement in the United States. Let's talk about who Manuel Zapata Oliveira was. He was born in Lorica, Colombia, which is near Cartagena de Indias. As you may know, Colombia is a very fragmented country. I would say that Cartagena de Indias has more in common with Havana or with San Juan than it does with uh, Bogota. And I mean that uh, because of its colonial history as a slave port, uh, because of the racial makeup of many people who live there, uh, the cultural makeup, the music, the way people speak is very similar to what you would see in the Antilles. So that is his cultural background. Uh, he was one of the first black students at the Universidad Nacional in Bogota. So he experienced uh, great alienation while he was in the nation's capital. And he was the person who organized the first Dia del Negro at his university. This is in the 1940s. He was a medical student, largely because his father wanted him to be. He wanted to uh, study literature and the arts. And uh, he did so once he finished uh, medical school. He was a communist, which led to him romanticizing things like the Chinese Revolution and uh, to political uh, problems, sometimes with the government. Uh, you can see this clearly in Chambacu uh, uh, Corral de Negros, where he's very harshly criticizing uh, the government for supporting the Korean War um, in the United States, sending troops from Colombia to support the United States. Uh, Zapata was also a folklorist because he wanted to show oral cultures as part of the national community, this being indigenous people and Afro-Colombians. So he's a real tra trailblazer in representing marginalized communities. He also was a great traveler. He traveled from Colombia to the United States on foot in the 1940s. Uh, as you can see here, in the Jim Crow South, he was interpreted as a, a black person and experienced firsthand the treatment of black people in the Jim Crow South uh, as he traveled through states like Alabama uh, and the Carolinas to name a few, Georgia as well. Uh, and so he has traveled the United States. He 
traveled to New York. He actually met Langston Hughes. He walks up to Langston Hughes' door, knocks on it, and says, can I stay here? And surprisingly, Langston Hughes said yes. And he actually spent an extended period uh, with Langston meeting the Black intelligentsia of Harlem. So he's marked by uh, African Americans and their culture. He was a professor at Howard University, but he's clearly a Latin American writer who is marked by the boom. Uh, the, the novela total, for example, this is a 750 page work. He's trying to tell the entire history of black people in the Americas. He's writing a nueva novela, a novel that mixes uh, prose with poetry and is very experimental in its use of language. And we can see this as a continuation of the avant-garde. If you read the first part of the novel, it will read as if uh, uh, Nicolas Quillen had written a long epic poem because it is literally that, a long epic poem. So let's get a concise definition of what Nuevo Mundo means according to this author. The Nuevo Mundo is a new humanity in the new world that has fought off the legacy of colonialism, including capitalism, racism, and sexism, to create a just world order for the individual and the collective. It's a mestizo Afrocentrism. Paul Gilroy takes great issue with Molefiquete Asante's notion of Afrocentrism because he finds it positivist and he finds it purist. That's not what Zapata is doing. He's creating a model of mestizaje, which is to say racial and cultural mixture that is empowering to indigenous people and to black people in particular. It's a counter narrative to the conquest. And you could say that Zapata's vision of that counter narrative is the revolt against the Nova India, another synonym for the New World. The Nova India is a slave ship. As you may know, the Portuguese invented the transatlantic slave trade. They were the pioneers and they started the armed race that became the conquest in the Americas. The Nova India is a slave ship in which the slavers, as was the custom at the time, uh, attempt to rape the enslaved women. In this case, and usually they, they would, that would be part of the process of the Middle Passage. Well, this infuriates everyone on board and a leader emerges who is the son of Changu. Changu is the spirit or the Yoruba god. Uh, his name is Nago el Navegante. Nago is the Yoruba who is the navigator. He's substituting Henry the Navigator. He's taking over the narrative from Henry the Navigator of the Portuguese. And this revolt not only kills the enslavers, but it also sets the, the ship on fire. Fire is Changu's symbol and the ship sinks into the Atlantic Ocean and then proceeds to travel throughout the Atlantic, gathering the souls of the dead who died during the Middle Passage. And they use the energy of those souls to foment revolution in the Americas. And so these are the archetypes of the heroes that reappear in the novel in different avatars. So just to place everything in, in context again, this is the overview of Chango el Gran Putas. So the novel begins in a mythical Africa, which is an, an epic of the Yoruba Orishas in which Chango, an angry king, allows the white wolf, Loba Blanca, to enslave his people and to take them to the new world and gives them the curse and the commandment to fight off their oppressors. It then proceeds through the transatlantic slave trade to Colombia in the first free people of the Americas called Palenque de San Basilio, Colombia. And it tells the legend, as I have argued, of Bancos Biojo and his founding of the Palenque. That freedom at the Quilombo or Palenque level proceeds to the national level 
in the Haitian Revolution, which was inspired by uh, African deities, the Loise. And then that extends to freedom of different sorts for all of the Americas, uh, or at least Latin America at this stage, with Simon Bolivar, Jose Padilla, Wale Jajinu, and Jose Maria Morelos. Bolivar and Padilla represent Colombia. Bolivar is known as El Libertador, the person who freed uh, many nations, but he allowed slavery to continue in Colombia until the 1850s. And Padilla is included in this narrative as a counter narrative to it because he is a great naval uh, leader who was executed for treason because uh, white officers were afraid of him. He was a pardo, he was a mixed race person, and they were afraid of pardocracia. They were afraid that he would lead a slave revolt and that they would put the pardos in control. And so he was betrayed by Bolivar when he was killed for treason. Dialeja Jinu was a great sculptor who was mulatto, and he is presented as supporting the uh, Minas Gerais conspiracy, and he's juxtaposed with uh, Palmares, Zumbij Palmares, and their just society. And Jose Maria Morelos represents freedom for not only African Americans, because he was abolitionist, but also for indigenous Americans, a, a more just vision of the raza cosmica in Mexico than Vasconcelos himself imagined. And the last third of the novel takes place in the United States and tells our Black history through conversations between an avatar of Angela Davis and the African spirits. Her avatar is called Agni Brown. In the original manuscript, she's still called Angela, and she is imprisoned. Uh, she's, an, she's educated. She's a researcher. She is imprisoned just like Angela Davis was. So as I mentioned, Che Guevara is a key inspiration for Manuel Zapata Oliveira. Uh, his vision of El Hombre Nuevo comes from his book, El Socialismo del Hombre en Cuba. Uh, his intent was to create a utopian uh, society uh, which would produce El Hombre del Siglo XXI. Well, how does he propose to do that? He proposes to do that through education, through knowledge of one's own culture, one's own national culture, uh, diversity of opinions, but not racial diversity per se. There's, he's drawing on the Jose Martí tradition of en Cuba, no hay racismo porque no hay razas, and equal economic possibilities. The Hombre Nuevo will uh, produce art that denounces continued inequalities but art that avoids realismo a ultranza, uh, which is to say socialist realism. Uh, I would argue that uh, in Cuba, socialist realism came to dominate uh, after uh, Zapata's, uh, rather after Che's death. And so you can see in Zapata a continuation of a different aesthetic that still supports these Marxist beliefs of creating the citizen of the future through social justice. And we can see strong parallels between uh, Motorcycle Diaries and uh, the travel narratives of Manuel Zapata Oliveira that informed this novel. Another influence is the New Negro Movement, uh, which was coined in the essay Enter uh, the New Negro, Negro by Alan Locke. Uh, his arguments in this essay were to unite the Black struggle in the North and the South and to focus on a new self-aware urban Black population. The New Negro is exemplified in the novel by Joe Stevens, who is a working class guy who works his way up through education. He goes to what we would now call a historically Black uh, college, and he goes on to become a jazz musician in New York. Uh, he plays the banjo. And so he's symbolizing the continuation of the uh, New Negro movement, uh, even in his lifespan, which takes place during the 1960s. We can also see uh, the connection with Hughes because Alan Locke's essay 
includes a poem by Hughes called Youth. It says, we have tomorrow bright before us like a flame, yesterday a night gone thing, a sundown name, and dawn today, and broad arch above the road we came. We march. Now youth shows the future as a flame. In Zapata's novel, the flame represents the deity Chang'o. Chang'o is the god of war. Chang'o is the war of just uh, is the god of justice, and he's a beautiful god. And so he's leading this march toward a just future, uh, much like Hughes describes in this poem. We can see in Zapata Oliveira a precursor to many critics from today. I, I've picked two as an example, uh, which would be uh, Odete Casamayor and Roberto Surbano, uh, who talk about different models for the Black subject. In the case of Casa Mayor, uh, she's studying Sara Gomez and Nicolás Guillén Ladrián, who are making films at the same time that Zapata is writing. Uh, their vision of the new Black subject, even though it's in communist Cuba, is not raceless like Che's idea. And it's definitely not atheist because they believe in Yoruba spirits just like Zapata. In the case of Roberto Surbano, he's already talking about, uh, or he is still talking about triple consciousness. He's reading Du Bois and applying it to Afro-Cuban art. And he says that the third part of triple consciousness is awareness of the diaspora throughout the Americas. That's something Zapata was already doing in 1983 in this novel. He's also, uh, Surbano also sees the Afro-Cuban subject as the citizen of the future because famously he has argued that Afro-Cubans still do not enjoy full citizenship on the island, which got him into a lot of trouble with a famous New York Times uh, article. So Casa Mayor and Surbano are two examples of the uh, critics that Zapato Oliveira uh, preceded in many ways. Zapato Oliveira was inspired by another Afro-Cuban, rather a, another Afro-Colombian named Jorge Artel. He's a very important uh, poet and Zapato Oliveira studied with him at the University of Cartagena before going on to the Universidad Nacional. And this is what he said about his mentor in the Afro-Hispanic Review. Sin perder el ancla de los ancestros, Artel va sumando los retos sociales que le plantea la ideología del proletariado. Se sabe poeta y combatiente y más allá de la crítica que impone falsas fronteras entre la emoción y el ideal, no vacila en martillar el poema con claros mensajes de liberación. Martí, Lenin, Fidel, El Che. Son apenas los cuatro puntos cardinales que orientan la cimarronería de los nuevos tiempos. So he already sees in his mentor the model of the cimarron as the rebel who will lead us to justice. Also, Artel considered himself Indo Mulato. He not only embraced his African heritage, but also his indigenous heritage. And his poetry plays out as a search for justice for Black people in the Americas, as well as the indigenous, which the Muntu includes, in the case of Zapata. So let's think about another area that Zapata was a precursor for, the new Jim Crow. Today, the prison industrial complex is locking up black subjects. It is denying people uh, their right to vote. I know that this has been a very heated uh, issue in Florida recently. Zapata's already uh, foreseeing that when he shows the imprisonment of Agni Brown, of um, Malcolm X, and of war protesters. Joe Stevens, the new Negro, quote unquote, is a, a protester against uh, the Vietnam War and he is arrested and the jailers attempt to give him drugs so that he will have an extended period, uh, an extended sentence. So you can see that Zapata is already foreseeing the use of the war on drugs 
to imprison people en masse for profit and to continue oppression today. He also foresees the uh, what's recently been called Afrofuturism, a look toward the future that includes black citizenship. This term was coined by Mark Derry in 1993, and it's very commonly applied to black science fiction. In the novel, the Changuar uh, Garamputas uh, ends with an apocalyptic scene in which the Orishas return and express their rage that the Muntu has not yet been free. Malcolm X's body, he's at his funeral with Agni Brown. She's evoking the ancestors. His body bursts forward, bur bursts open, and out comes a Seba tree that carries all the souls of the dead into the future and asks us, how can we bring on an end to this unjust world, an end to this unjust order? In this way, he is a precursor to uh, the uh, people that we would now call Chicano futurists or Chicana futurism, like uh, Catherine Ramirez, uh, Gloria Anzaldúa is much better known, her Nueva Mestiza, uh, Vision of the Future, as well as Isabel Millán's Afro-Latina heroines. In conclusion, Zapata's chronopolitics rewrite history, combining myth and historiography to present an empowering past for the African diaspora. He adapts his influences to an inter-American struggle for liberation. He focuses on Latin America in a more encompassing way than the Black Atlantic. His Nuevo Mundo is a radical vision of the future in which Black leadership establishes a just society for all involved. And finally, Zapata's radical mestizaje, genetic, cultural, poetic, provides a model for a radically new world order that anticipates the minority futurisms of today. Thank you for your time. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much for that inspiring presentation. Uh, when we have um, around 20 minutes uh, to listen any question, comment for the audience or the participants. And while nobody is um, writing, I don't see, oh, there is one here. Uh, well, we have a, a question for you in Spanish. Um, probably you can see it there, Sean. And if you are going to publish the book in Spanish, uh, probably in Colombia in the future. That's a wonderful question, Maria. I, thank you for that question. I would love to do that. Uh, it just came out and I'm very excited uh, that it did, but if the opportunity presented itself, I, I would love to do that. Thank you. So maybe we need to start to think in probably somebody to translate the book or you are going to do it, John? By yourself. I, I would definitely need some, some help with that, but that's a wonderful idea. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, let's see. Mauricio, we have a question there. Um, uh, I'm taking, well, he's taking a course on Afrofuturists and they are reading, I don't know that novel, so Black No More, which imagine an America with little or no black people. Uh, is there a similar text in Latin American literature? And would this question be complicated by the dynamic of mestizaje and the inclusion of indigenous ethnicities? And I, I really uh, welcome this question because one, uh, what I was thinking, Sean, and maybe you can maybe uh, talk about both my question and Mauricio at the same time. I was thinking in inviting you to explore a little further this idea to understand Muntu as a mestizo Afrocentric. But mm -hmm. I think I think it's very complicated because my question is going to be like uh, Mauricio say how we are going to conceive this uh, mestizaje without erasing the black identity or what is going to happen or, or please explore further uh, this kind of mestizaje and Afrocentrism. Yes. Uh, well, the the first question, Mauricio's uh, or Mar Mauricio's is. Uh, a key part of uh, mestizaje in Latin America as it's been imagined uh, ever since the 19th century. Uh, really, you could look at, at it in the colonial period as well because you have lots of mixed race people from the first day of the, the conquest. And so naturally, 
uh, people who were white or whiter uh, or had a higher casta, as they called it, had more opportunities and had more power. So mestizaje uh, throughout, uh, at least until the 20th century, is a whitening project. It's a way to breed out or to exclude people that were considered inferior, which would usually be black people or uh, indigenous people. If you look at uh, Jose de Vasconcelos, for example, if you read uh, the Raza Cosmica carefully, and you think about the implications of his project, you notice that he's trying to breed out what at that time were considered inferior races. So you have, it, there, it says there are few black people in Mexico and that they will, their race will quickly be bred out. And he says that the Indio is a puente. He says the, the Indian is a bridge to la raza cosmica, which is this uh, virile combination of the best of all the races that have come before, which inadvertently is, or actually in his case, understand it, in an understanding way, is a way of breeding a future without black people or without the mestizo people as, he, as they were known at that time. So uh, you see other uses of mestizaje as a way of justifying oppression. Uh, you have the case of Brazil. Brazil is very famous for being a racial democracy. Uh, we have uh, Gilberto Freire uh, being the mouthpiece for racial democracy where um, mixed Mixing races is a way to establish harmony and therefore we don't need to bring on uh, changes uh, that would address uh, social inequalities based on race. So that's what people often hear when I say mestizo or mestizaje uh, in Latin America. Now Zapata is writing in a context where he wants his country to embrace mestizaje so that uh, people share cultural influences. Uh, so you've got a cultural sharing that does not uh, erase, for example, the African origins of, or the black origins of the Vallenato, uh, because he's traveling throughout uh, Colombia with his sister Dalia, with a folklore group to preserve these oral traditions. Uh, and he's envisioning a, uh, a mestizaje that includes and clearly shows the influences of previously excluded groups. So it's not to say that he's trying to exclude black people or breed them out in the most extreme case like Vasconcelos, but that he's showing their influence as part of the history of the nation. Thank you, John. Uh, there is uh, two more questions. Um, yes, and there is one more. Okay, Carla already. Okay, there are two more questions also in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you are referring to those. Uh, yes. Okay. No, it's, it's okay if you want to read it. Your... No, 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 please go ahead. I mean, oh. yes. So the question reads, can you elaborate on the connection between Zapata Oliveira's poetics of rewriting Black history and Che Guevara's announcement of the new man? Uh, it's something interesting to look at, but Zapata's ideological affiliation seems scarcely an explanation to understand uh, this, con this continental solidarity between both uh, intellectuals. So Zapata's ideological affiliation is scarcely an explanation. Uh, he, Zapata in his biography asks himself if he is an hombre nuevo, if he himself is an hombre nuevo. Um, so uh, there definitely is a connection there. I, uh, his Chambacu Corral de Negros uh, received an honorable mention uh, from the Casa de las Americas in 1962 in mm -hmm. Cuba. Uh, che was an inspiration to an entire uh, generation. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that even though this novel comes out in, in 1983, there is very little mention of uh, what of the separation that many intellectuals uh, felt after the Caso Padilla, uh, very little uh, call, taking to task of the revolution for not doing more to, um, to aid Black subjects, to aid uh, Afro-Cubans. Uh, and I, uh, I think that that is something that the novel itself could have delved into because he's taking a, 
Bolivar to task for not doing enough to liberate uh, Afro-Colombians and Af uh, Afro subjects. Uh, he could have done the same with, uh, with Castro, uh, but he chose not to. But there's definitely a connection there. Um, John, we have uh, another question uh, for Carla Calache in the beginning, say, in Buntu culture. Can you read that? The concept of the Muntu is intimately linked to the Ubuntu, at least at this interaction and in the writing of the Montutu. Are there similarity between the Nuevo Muntu and the South African version of it? I am not a specialist in uh, the writings of Desmond Tutu, so I, I'd like to, to give that, that caveat. I do know that um, the, uh, the right, he's, that Zapata is working with uh, uh, Philosophie Bantu, which is a work uh, that uh, was written uh, by a priest named Tempels, uh, who is writing about uh, a worldview that is shared by uh, many sub-Saharan peoples. Uh, and so the notion of community that is uh, in Ubuntu, uh, the notion is shared in Muntu because in the novel he states there is no family that is greater than the Muntu. So the, the Muntu individual is connected to the family and to the collective. Uh, and so I know that he was a great admirer of uh, Mandela, Nelson Mandela, uh, and so uh, it's, they're, they're definitely uh, in harmony uh, with one another, but I don't pretend to, to know more about uh, Ubuntu uh, than, than what I've said. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, there is another question that is coming now. Is, is there a connection with Zapata and the Negritudes movement in Latin America and the Caribbean? Yes. Uh, the, uh, an example would be Senghor um, in, in Senegal. Uh, there is, uh, he, Zapata is a storyteller, so I always wonder how much uh, actually happened and how much is just him weaving a good yarn. Uh, but what he says is that the, the epic that is the opening for this novel uh, was inspired by his visit to Senegal, uh, and he wanted to spend the night in the, the island of Gore which was a, uh, a warehouse for slaves, supposedly. Um, and so he spends the night in uh, this warehouse, this prison of enslaved people, uh, and he speaks with his ancestors. He, he speaks with those dead souls that inspire him to write uh, this, uh, to, to write this epic and to complete his, his great novel. Uh, if that happened, there, how are we going to find out? But it's a, it is a wonderful story. He also says that he told people he was related to uh, a, a Zapata, Emiliano Zapata in Mexico, and they believed him. They, he says that he was painted in uh, Diego Rivera's murals. Uh, he, yeah. he says all kinds of things that maybe did happen, but we don't know uh, the, the facts behind them. But yes, he was definitely an admirer of the Negritude movement. Yeah, we also have in the chat a follow-up question for Carla. Um, she explains Ubuntu translates roughly as I am a person through other people. But I love that translation. So it is an understanding of the individual and the dependent on community. And I think that is, is a wonderful idea to think in, in Zapata Olivesha or in Zapata Olivesha's work, uh, how he uh, understands this kind of relationship between the subject and the community to build this new world, this Nuevo Muntu. I don't know if you want to comment on that. I mean, absolutely, whether his influence is Marx or Fanon, he was a great reader of Fanon, Franz Fanon, um, or, the, or the actual African beliefs, because he's, he's uh, trying to use these beliefs as a resource, as a philosophical inspiration that we can use in the 20th, in his case, or in the 21st century, uh, in our own to work together. And mestizaje is a part of that uh, because if you're going to pit oppressed people against one another, indigenous versus uh, African, African Afro-descended people, uh, then you're not going to achieve that Nuevo Mutu ideal. So absolutely, there is no family that is greater than the Mutu. He says that explicitly. 
So coming back to this idea, Sean, because there is no other uh, question here, so maybe I can ask you something. Um, to just to keep exploring the, the world of Zapato Libesha, because I, I didn't mention in the beginning, but uh, Colombia is recognizing this 2020 year as the, the Zapato Libesha, el año de Zapato Libesha, so the year of Zapato Libesha. And if more people are interested in his work, um, also I think is University of, I, I, don't, I don't remember right now, uh, they have in PDF the, the whole works on Zapato Libesha available for the public, so you can go to the internet and read the whole uh, collection of work that is a lot. And the other thing I didn't mention that maybe you can comment also, John, because you, you know better than me, uh, the university, Vanderbilt University has the um, archive of the manuscript and the document. So also there is another opportunity for graduate students because I know that we have a, a huge group of graduate students listen to this presentation. So they can maybe in the future go into Vanderbilt University and make the research or have a project. Uh, so my question was related with this, um, with this utopian war. Uh, we need to think that it's a war and this is just because I really want that you elaborate more. We need to think that it's a word without race or without racism. Well, uh, thank you for mentioning the, the events. You've got uh, the University of Cartagena putting together El Primer Encuentro uh, de Investigadores in Afro Latino America, which is uh, going to be this, uh, this summer. It's, it's probably going to be virtual, like a lot of things. Uh, it hasn't announced it as such yet, but that's something that people can still sign up for. Advanced graduate students, if you guys want to go out and present your work in a place where you're going to meet a lot of influential people uh, on this topic, do it. Um, I, I, was, I had the honor and the privilege of being uh, one of the first researchers to work with the Vanderbilt uh, archives. Uh, they're all there, and they're still, when I was working on them, they, they weren't cataloged yet. They were just in boxes because they came from, from somebody's house. Um, so uh, that's something that, uh, that you can, can work with. It's a very, very valuable resource. Um, and the Ministerio de Cultura uh, has digitized uh, his, uh, uh, Zapata Oliveira's work, and, so, and Vanderbilt is doing that as well. The Bolsa de los Abuelos project, uh, his letters, because uh, there's a correspondence between him and Langston Hughes, for example. Uh, he's, he corresponded with Abigias de Nascimento. They have those documents at, uh, at Vanderbilt. Uh, the, the notion of a world without race is I think the, um, the apocalyptic nature of the text is if, uh, if a truly just world existed, would, be able, would we be able to recognize it? Would we have words for this radically different uh, place? I, I don't know if I would call it a world without race because it's a place, but it's definitely the goal of a, a world without racism. And so we have to ask ourselves, can race exist without racism? I think that race would exist in the sense that the Muntu represents a history of the Americas that is Afrocentric in the sense that it represents African contributions to the Americas. Uh, and as we've, uh, we've seen even in, in American politics, there's a huge debate over uh, Trump's new ideal of, uh, of telling American history without ever saying it's racist. Well, I don't think that that is in any way uh, what Manuel Zapata Oliveira was, was going for. So I think that he's imagining a just world that, yes, has races and that notices the contributions of those different races where race means the history of a people, not any kind of uh, eugenic definition of race. Thank you. I think we have the last question there. In the okay. chat. Oh. oh, thank you, Dr. Moore. Uh, this is a great talk. Uh, thank you. Do you have any thoughts as to what enabled Zapata Oliveira to prophesy things like the mass incarceration of people of color? Since Changol has been translated to English, why is Zapata not better known in the U.S. and the English-speaking world? And beyond resonating with current events, in what ways do you think Zapata's writing might favorably, favorably influence today's social activists, especially those in the BLM movement? Uh, so I'm gonna try to take these one at a time and, and be brief. Um, 
okay, uh, prophecy, things like mass incarceration, because he takes a long view of the African diaspora. The African diaspora has always been imprisoned. Slavery is imprisonment. And so the law in most cases has worked against uh, black people, even when they're in heroic roles like uh, Jose Prudencio Padilla, who is literally fighting for the country, and then he's imprisoned and executed as a traitor. So if you take a long view, you're able to foresee this is what's coming next. I see Nixon locking up the protesters. I see people being uh, arrested for small drug charges for prostitution, and I see where this is going. Um, since Changol has been translated to English, uh, why is he not better known? Uh, well, I'm doing my best, right? I'm trying to get the word out. Uh, I was taken aback when three specialists in Latin American literature, who are the best at, uh, at Vanderbilt University, uh, they were inter being interviewed for a job. None of them had heard of this guy. That's what, what's astounding to me. This guy writes as well and was as prolific as anybody from the boom, but people don't know him. And I think that the English translation uh, and this new focus on racial justice is definitely going to contribute to that just recognition as part of uh, the 2020 celebration of his life and work. Uh, and uh, lastly, beyond resonating with current events, what messages uh, do you uh, would it convey to uh, BLM? I think that BLM is already seeing a lot of things that Zapata uh, already foresaw, which is a pan-African movement. Uh, you've got uh, either Black Lives Matter or movements that are inspired by Black Lives Matter uh, in Latin America. I think that uh, taking that broad vision of how the United States is seen throughout the world, how our uh, conflicts over racial justice in the past uh, are influencing other people for better or for worse. In many cases in Latin America, people got their first televisions and their first image of images of the United States were of Birmingham and people being sprayed with fire hoses. That's horrifying. And so uh, Black, Lives Matters, Black Lives Matter as a global movement is fulfilling a key part of what Zapata foresaw with the Nuevo Mundo. Well, thank you very much, Sean. It has been a very, very wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm going to use the, the last minute just to, to thank you again. And maybe you can uh, reflect a little bit on Afri uh, African, uh, Afro-Latin American styles, that is a growing field right now. And thinking in graduate student, what, what you see that is going in the field and what the, the, the kind of research that you would like to see uh, in Afro-Latin American styles? What would I like to see? Uh, well, I'm trying to, uh, I think that gender is a key part of uh, where Afro, uh, African American studies and Afro Latino, uh, Afro Latin American studies are going. I think that that's something that uh, maybe the first uh, generation, some of them uh, uh, overlooked. Definitely, Delita Martin Ogunshola did not. Um, but I think that now we're very much informed by uh, gender studies. I think that uh, LGBTQ studies and queer theory. Uh, is a very important part of uh, this field and that deserves a lot, uh, a lot more study. Uh, I think that it's gonna inform even folks who are working in colonial literature uh, to think about uh, subjectivity and uh, desire and identity uh, in a different way. I think that um, we need to be careful about separating Afro-Latin America from the African-American tradition, because I think that both traditions uh, are very important for one another. Uh, there is a, a movement uh, as of late, uh, I'm thinking of Silvia Valero or mm -hmm. uh, Alejandro de la Fuente, uh, people who are very reasonably uh, seeking a Black movement that is unique or autochthonous to Latin America, that speaks directly to those local realities that people are dealing with. And I think that's a very uh, a fertile uh, area of study. I don't want it to become that is uh, 
that comes in con that tries to ignore and influence a very positive influence that is there from the United States because uh, the United States has such a rich intellectual tradition uh, in the African American uh, literary and philosophical tradition that I think that it's it's not always going to be productive to exclude the United States from that conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, you all, for being here with us today. And hopefully we are going to see you in our next uh, conversation. Bye. Thank you again. Muito obrigado. Gracias. Okay, thank you. I, I hope that uh, you all enjoyed the talk. Yes. And see you here again on November 3rd. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Maddox. Uh, I love the, the entire talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.